it's really nice to see everyone tonight. And thank you for coming here um, to this space to talk about uh, Sheila's work, which I think is so um, important. And right now in this moment, and it's important before this moment, and it's important after this moment. So I feel, I feel really, um, I'm really happy that you're that you're able to do this tonight, Sheila. Given everything that's going on right now, and oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. PPAC, and we we understand. We stand by the protesters, and we believe right. mm -hmm. in the work that they're doing, and we condemn violence, um, especially police violence. Right. So I'm really, I'm just, I feel really um, thankful that you're willing to take the time to talk tonight, given the circumstances. This is a really hard time. So um, yeah. I thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm going to pass it over to Lori at PPAC to give a proper introduction of Sheila and her work. Um, so thank you. Thank you. So this is the first time today I've been able to uh, meet Sheila, although I've followed her work for decades, mm -hmm. almost for decades. <laughs> and uh, I was so excited to have this opportunity to invite you into PPAC's community um, to have you share your work with us. Uh, and our community is broadening um, and uh, it's just a real honor. So here's my official introduction. I'm so happy to see you. Uh, Sheila Pre Bright is an acclaimed national and international photographic artist known for her photographic series, Young Americans, Plastic Bodies, and her most ambitious project to date, hashtag 1960 Now, which was featured at the Southeast Museum of Photography, Daytona, Florida, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Georgia. Bright earned an MFA in photography from Georgia State University and received the center prize from the Santa Fe Center of Photography for her series, Suburbia, <laughs> in 2006. Welcome, Sheila. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that um, I'm driving the slideshow. Uh, feeling very powerful about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, sh uh, Sheila would appreciate your comments and questions and um, maybe Michelle can watch if people want to raise their hands. I think I think Sheila is open to a conversational. Oh question. yes, of course. Yeah, that's what we're here for. <laughs> All, right. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up the slideshow, and um, Sheila, I'll just follow your lead. Okay. Here we go. That's your picture of the of you in working in COVID. Yes, I think that we have to. First of all, I want to thank. Um, the contemporary um, for having me and I thank everybody for um, joining the conversation because I think it's something that we need because I consider myself a photographic artist and I'm really interested in individuals and communities that are often unseen. So I like to tell contemporary stories about social, political, and historical context um, to actually challenge the narratives of Western thought and power stru structures. So that is who I am as an artist using the medium of photography. And I started my career um, in Houston, Texas in hip hop culture. Um, I'm a daughter of a soldier. Um, I think I'm was naive about a lot of things, but I, and I grew up around diversity, a mixture of people. And, but I had a curiosity, you know, when I graduated from um, college, my undergrad, I wanted hip hop was the culture. And at that time it was gangster rap. And I was very curious about gangster rap. So I would go and hang in third ward and fifth ward in Houston, Texas, and wanted to photograph portraits for um, of, of hip hop. 
And that's what I started doing. And this first image that you see is Big Mike. He was part of the Ghetto Boys. I don't know if you guys, I don't know how young or <laughs> old you are. I can't see people in the audience. That was back in 1995. You can go on to the next slide. And um, you could show back then, I actually self-taught, believe it or not. In this image that you see um, right here is Class C. And he wanted me to take photographs for his CD cover. And that was back then it was film and that was the last shot on the roll. And I didn't know what to do. So I asked him to point the gun at me. And he says, you want me to point the gun at you? And I'm like, yes, point the gun at me. And that's the image that I have. And me being in the culture, I had a lot of, um, of, of, of the guys wanted me to take photographs. I remember going to a home and just just being very naive and i was asking all the young men why are you all in one house <laughs> you know and they came out with aka guns and everything and i asked them i said are those real and they looked at me and said you're like a white girl in a black body where did you come from so that was the beginning of my career in hip-hop and this image that you see right now is scarface um, he was the ghetto boys, but he broke off. And actually now he ran for city council that year, but he didn't win. And he was talking about, you know, it was gangster rap. But when I say gangster rap, I'm talking about how hip hop became the voice, I believe, from the civil rights movement. And it was the voice of the community. They were like the CNN from there. So you go. So as I um, continue working, because I always hung around professional photographers, that's where I learned the craft and the technical end of photography. And when I came to Atlanta, I am not from the South. I wasn't raised in the South, but my parents were raised in the South and they came from the era of, of Jim Crow. When they're young people that had to say, yes, ma'am, no, sir. They had to look down if a white person passed them and crossed the street. And that's the environment my, my parents came from. So when I came to Atlanta in, say, about 1999, my father, he saw the imagery, the photographs that I was taking, and he told me that I needed to go to grad school. And I received my MFA in, at, here in Atlanta, Georgia, at Georgia State University. That's when I began to understand the historical context of what I was shooting. For example, when I shot the hip hop culture, my first art show was in Houston, but I didn't, I didn't understand about the historical context of that. I didn't understand how black bodies looked on, were looked at. I was like, oh, these are, these images are cool of these black males, you know? And a friend, I'm going back to that before I go back to this, this work right here, because I have to say this. Um, a friend of mine, which is an artist, told me that when he saw the work of the hip hop culture, these portraits that I've taken, he said, you need to be in a show. And I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you do. He brought a curator over. And the curator thought that I would have just cutesy like fashion images. And when he saw that, he says, you have to be in the show. I didn't know anything about galleries, museums or anything. So I was in the show and I, actually painted spray painted shoe boxes from tennis shoes and i would set these images inside the shoe box because i wanted people when they see these images to actually be face to face with that and so i didn't come to the show the curator called me he says sheila you got to come and i said no i don't i said because pictures speak for themselves why do i have to come I'm very shy. I don't like to talk to people or anything. That's how I got into photography because I, the camera speaks 
for me. So that was my first, that's how I entered into the art world, not really understanding it. And, and when I came to Atlanta, that's when I received my MFA, I began to understand the historical context of how black bodies were looked upon. So this body of work um, called Suburbia, I myself sometimes feel that as an African-American and a woman, I was projecting the same type of imagery that the media project of African-Americans and what we always see as black males and people with this perception of stereotype as thug and criminal and going into the marginalized communities. That's all we see on the media. We don't see anything else. So at the time, I thought it would be interesting for me to turn my camera into African-American culture on the suburbia side because those are the type of imagery, still imagery that we do not see in the art world. And at that time when I produced this body of work in 2006, um, I won a major award for this body of work and I called it Suburbia. And I had to go and speak before, I say about 200 or 300 people. I was so nervous because before I spoke, the day before, I had to have curators, publishers, curators, book, book editors to look at the work. And even though I won this award, the main consensus of this body of work, I was told, we have never heard of your suburbia. Why didn't you call it Black suburbia? Um, you don't have enough signifiers in this work to show that these are black homes. And a publisher says, you don't have enough signifiers. So I asked him this, I said, what is it that you wanna see? Fried chicken, collard greens, and watermelon. And he could not say anything. So the whole purpose of Suburbia was trying to show that just a typical, ordinary life of African-Americans that live in Suburbia. And as a, African-American, we're always told, oh, you're always talking about identity, identity. I was just trying to show the universal commonality amongst all people. But what was projected on me was that I didn't have enough stereotypes in this work to show that these were black homes. And that really baffled me because we're in the 21st century and this work was um, done in 2006. So moving on from there, 2013, I believe, um, Trayvon Martin happened. And I'm always trying to find the beauty in something that society dim as negative, because I always tell people, if you can't see the justice or beauty in this, there's no love, because we talk about love a lot. But if you can't see the beauty and justice, there's no love at all. And when Trayvon Martin happened, I started really thinking about young people, how the young people are the ones like now are going to have are, are making the change. So I reached back to the elders in the movement um, that were in the civil rights movement that were unknown because I wanted to talk to them more about the movement because of what was happening with Trayvon Martin and everybody. And I took portraits of them and when all that, all it kept continuing, continuing, I as an artist felt that I needed to go to ground, to the ground to find out what was going on myself. And the imagery that you see, I purposely shot in black and white because I, and I call the work 1960 now, because what had the young people were saying, we are fighting the same fights that our parents and grandparents have had. And they really don't, they, there was a hashtag out called Reclaim Martin Luther King Day. And the purpose of that was because they said they're tired of the, the um, commercialization of Martin Luther King, I have a dream. He was much more of a dream. He was about resistance. And I met 
Mr. Lonnie King, these are all the, these images are in Atlanta in different protests. And Mr. Lonnie King, who started the Atlanta Student Movement, he was 20 years old at the time in 1960. He told me this, he said, when we took down the signs, black and white, he said, we thought we had it made, but what happened was they went on cruise control. He said, we didn't continue the fight at all. And so this is the result of what's going on with these young kids because they are, especially African-American kids, some of them, a lot of them, they're far removed from the movement and everything else because they feel like it's not about racism. And then all of this is happening now in our face and now we have um, George Floyd. And you can move on with the images. This was, this was taken in Atlanta. And this is more, and this was before COVID-19. This image right now is post-COVID-19. And this is a state representative um, with a mask, stop killing, stop killing us. I went to a press conference this week um, with the mothers whose children have fallen to police brutality. And if any of you guys visit my IG, Instagram feed, um, she pre bright you could listen to the mother's narratives. Because for me as an artist for five years, I've been on the ground photographing protests. And I feel as an artist like, and I have a book, <laughs> this book, um, 1960 Now, I don't know if you guys can see this, and I've been lecturing internationally and nationally. And I as an artist feel like, am I, <laughs> Am I helping? Am I doing anything? Because now we have George Floyd. You could go to Floyd. You could go to the next image. And within my work, I people call me a journalist. I'm not a journalist because when I'm on the ground, I'm looking for imagery. Even though these are protest images, I'm looking for imagery that the media doesn't put in the um, paper. Usually it's a black male standing on a car, kicking a car and you got fired. And that still projects the, ne the negative stereotype of a black male. This black male is crying. And I, th those are the images that I, I, I like to show because I'm not on the ground, even though it's a lot going on at the time, I am not clicking the shutter on my camera. I'm waiting for that moment and then I will click on the shutter. And this woman, this is a real interesting image for me because this was also in Atlanta. And this young lady, you could, I feel like you could see the sorrow in her eyes, but what she was doing was holding a liberation flag and standing on American flag. So you know what the media is gonna show. They're gonna show that full image of her on the, her, what, standing on the American flag. But I felt that for this image to see the pain in her eyes, some people say it's defiant, it's not defiant, it's she's hurt. These young people are hurt and they're angry. And I've seen the fear. I've seen the fear. You can move on to the next, yes. And we are not disposable. So I traveled from, I started in Atlanta, from Atlanta to Ferguson, to Baltimore, to Baton Rouge, in Washington, D.C. You could go through the images, yeah. And this is another image that I shot this weekend. I felt that I wanted to show this. These are the mothers of, um, one of the mothers from her child was lost here in Houston, in Atlanta. Atlanta has a lot of killings here, but you don't hear a lot about that. And, and, it, and it's very hard, but there's a lot, lot of mothers here in Atlanta whose children have fallen through police brutality. So they were there um, telling their narratives with the state leg legislators. And all of them were women. It was so powerful. And they're trying to, like the next step we need is legislation, reform, and that's what they were there for. 
you love our people and we'll be there until justice is done. And what's so really interesting about now, it's really exciting to see that all nationalities are out on that street now and that we cannot stop. We still gonna have to, even those, those officers were arrested and was charged, we still, like Mr. King said, we can't stay on cruise control. We gotta keep resisting and fighting. And I'm talking about all of us. Flag is in distress. That photograph was taken in Ferguson. So I'm gonna to talk to you about this image right here. In 2019, the end of last year, um, the Washington Post, um, the photo curator, the photo, uh, not, it's not a curator, the photo editor called me about doing an essay on racism. And I was like, I am so tired of talking about racism because it seemed like people don't want to change, you know, what's the point? So I told him that I would do it under the conditions that I would not photograph people because we're so caught up on flesh, we can't get past it. And I really want to talk, I wanted to talk about um, the history of Stone Mountain, Georgia, I mean the Stone Mountain Park. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Stone Mountain Park where they have three uh, it's a granite, one of the largest granites in, in the country. It's called Stone Mountain, Stone Mountain Park. And it's rooted in great suffering and systematic injustices. They have carvings of the Confederate soldiers there. And this was the place in 19, I believe, I, think, I might have the year wrong, but it's 1915, 1920 where the it was the second coming of the kkk and they still allow the um they're called the white nationalists now to come up on that mountain to protest so i wanted to show how beautiful this park is but how it is rooted in this injustice inequality and you can keep running through the images with that and that's the carving of the three generals Go oh, ahead. Yeah. And W. Du Bois, uh, a scholar and a professor back in that in, in 1920s, he called, I call this the invisible empire. And because W. Du Bois talked about how beautiful Georgia is, but how disturbing it is. And I'm using symbolic reference, reference to talk about the work. You see the Confederate flag is, is, is beautiful, but it's really rooted in a lot of hatred. And I use this to talk about, I'll let you guys think about that. And could go on. Yeah, invisible. So what I try to do right now, because I talked about how you use your imagination and creativity in a time like this, and then especially with me as an African-American, American where my parents have dealt with, young parents have dealt with trauma and it goes through generation and generation and generation. And for me to look at all this symbolism, how can I use my imagination creativity, you know, dealing with all this suffering. So I'm always looking back at the past to the present. And this image right here is Richard Avedon's image. He was one of my influence when I was in grad school because he photographed portraiture and people. And I've always been interested in people. Um, in my early years, I actually grew up in Germany. And my mother used to have, I have two sisters and a brother. And my mother would have us all on the train. And, and the German people, if I could say it like this, 
they were always talking to my mother and I was a small child and I didn't understand it. They wanted to touch our hair and our skin. And I was wondering why they want to do that. And so I think that was a reference for me as a small child about people and why people have their ideologies and upon other races. And I think that's what informed, I think that's one of the things that informed my work because I'm really looking at the human condition and trying to find the universal commonality amongst all of us. So this image of Richard Avedon in 2000, the end of 2018, I was approached by an art organization here in Atlanta. And you had all the stuff about the killings of, 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 of black bodies, women and men. And they commissioned about 10 artists to do murals in Atlanta. And at the time when they sent me information about it, they never told me that it was part of the NFL. And I had a problem with the NFL because I stand with Colin Kaepernick on that. And so when I came, went to the press conference, they wanted me to go to the press conference. And when I found out, I was like, I be damned. What have I gotten myself into? And the media came, was all over me, asked me what I was gonna do. I said, I have to listen to the voice of the people. I don't know. But in my mind, when I was talking with them, I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. But I had people saw me on TV. They said, Sheila, you got to do this. So I said, OK, I'm going to do a protest within a protest there. And I'm going back. I'm trying to get to a point, you guys. Um, this image by Richard Avedon, and I did not know this. He came to Atlanta in 1963 to photograph portraits of the civil rights leaders here. And he took some um, street images of protests. I did not know that that was part of his life. The image you see before you is a civil rights leader, Julian Bond, holding his nine-month-old daughter. And behind him are the SNCC students and it's an organization, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and they're fighting for injustice, voting, everything. And this is a beautiful, beautiful image. And when I saw this image, I said, I want to recreate this image with the mothers of police brutality. So I go on to the next image. This photograph was taken in 1963. So I was able to um, reach um, Eric Garner's mother, I Can't Breathe, Samira Rice's mother, which is Tamir Rice, the young boy that had the little toy gun in Ohio and he got shot. And Oscar Grant's mother back, I think it was back in 2009 where he was at the train station in Oakland and they did a movie about him in Fruitville. And the rest of the mothers that you see are from Atlanta. And the oldest woman that's in there is Dr. Rosalind Pope. She was part of the Atlanta student movement at the age of um, 19, and she authored The Appeal of Human Rights. And this was one of my last images, and the woman in the middle is Eric Garner's mother, Miss Gwendolyn Carr, and she held her hand out. And that, to me, I, in my mind, when I took this photograph, because it was at the very end, I said, this is it because it shows like when you look at Richard Avedon's image of Julian Bond, he's with Chow. And you see this image, it, she's without Chow. And the rose petals are the fallen children that they don't have. And this image was taken in Vine City too. And one thing that I wanted to say about Richard Avedon, when he came back up north, a lot of his colleagues, and his peers really were upset with him for doing that. And he did not photograph for two years behind that. I did not know that. And so I created a mural. And you can go on to the next image. The historical reference of the past and the present. And this is in Atlanta. 
and still up. It still looks good. It's about 30 feet high. So I have brought my, I've been doing this though. I came from museums and galleries with the white walls, which I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that. But I feel that my work speaks more to the masses of the people. So I love to have my images out, out of the galleries behind the white walls. Do anybody have any questions? Because I, I don't like to keep talking. <laughs> well, I think you're great. Have... Right. This is Sarah from PPAC. I think the images speak so loudly when they're outside of the gallery space. Right, right, right. And I think that's where mine really is, 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 is visible um, with that, is to do that. But I think we have to do it all. Like people feel like, oh, they don't need to protest. Yes, they do. We need to, there's different layerings of different things that we are. It's like a musical instrument. You have all these different parts to it and everybody has to play their parts. The people that's on the streets and the people that are not on the streets. So that's my kind of, so you know who I am as an artist. And I, 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 as far as imagination and creativity with the suffering of my culture and what we have to go through, I use my imagination and creativity to move forward. Just like with, now we're in COVID-19. And if you think about COVID-19, it, 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 it started off with your lungs and I can't breathe. And then now you have George Floyd and what the officer did, I can't breathe, okay? So we're being challenged as, I don't know if, if all, of the, all of you guys are image creators, image makers, we're being challenged, I feel, to get out of our comfort zone. And I'm not talking about just photographing protest images. How are we gonna move moving forward because for me before george floyd came i love to connect with people i love to talk to them i don't like going into a situation and just start photographing and now you have to rethink about how you're going to go about doing that and really use your imagination about how are you going to create work? And what are the things that you might want to say in the work? And there was a question that came up that I, I, it, I, I saw and I didn't. Now what quote are you spending? It said, are you spending less time for what? Can someone read that out for me? I can. Have you generally spent a lot of time with a subject before photographing them? Say that again so now. <clears throat> Sorry, I speak too fast. Um, uh -huh. If you generally spend a lot of time with the subject before photographing them. Also, now with COVID, are you spending less time with the subject? Right. Pre-COVID, a lot of times with the, um, with, with the subject. Now, no. And that doesn't feel good to me. Like, for example, when COVID-19 I'm driving in the car taking photographs. That's not something I, I would do at all, you know? And then when I get out, I'm keeping my distance. So I feel that there's really not a connection um, with, the, with people because you don't, I, 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 it's just the connection. That's what I was saying that I think that we have to, we're gonna have to rethink and rewired our mind of how we're going to do this. It's like I'm talking to everybody on a through virtual reality, and I I don't like that. I like to see, you know, I like to see. So it's hard. It's like I went out to the um, press conference with the mothers, you know, and you have as an to be out there on the streets now, especially with protests, and there's no social distancing at all. Some people wearing masks, some people not wearing masks. So I don't stay in spots very long. I'm very observant and I move fast. So there was one question earlier um, about you. Uh, you talked about um, someone was uh, articulating to you that you seem like a white girl in a black woman's body. Right. 
And so, um, how did you take that in? How did you respond to that? I laugh. <laughs> I was shocked. You know, you're twins, you know. You know, you and your twin. It was nothing to really think about. It's but ridiculous, but, right? Yeah, it's like looking back at it, it was just that I was very naive back then. And I think that's what allowed me to get into the culture, even though I'm African American, but I came from a different economic, you know, level from that, you know, and I wanted to know. And one thing that I always tell people, whether shooting protests or going into the communities, you can't show fear, okay? Because they'll know, they'll pick that up. <laughs> that's true true yeah it's true. <laughs> as a photographer you have to um know where you stand before you yes you there. do yes you do yeah because um when i went into baltimore i was actually in baltimore when freddie gray passed that sunday and that monday is when they start doing the protests and i went to um the 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 community of where he was at in West, ba I think, yeah, West Baltimore. I didn't know anybody. And when I got out of the car, had my cameras, and I'm walking around naiveness again, I'm older. <laughs> I'm like, where am I at? I felt like I was in a third world country. I've been to Chicago. I've been to other places, but something about Baltimore looked different to me. And I got totally cussed out and told me to get the hell out. We don't want you here, white people here, or the media here, because the only time when you come into our communities, you want to talk about something negative, but you're not here when we're sweeping up the streets. You're not here for none of it. And you have to think fast on your feet. And I told them this. I said, look, you don't know me. I'm from Atlanta, the home of the civil rights movement, and I wants to tell our stories because we our stories have always been told from the white perspective narratives and i said i want to tell our stories that's how i was able to for them for for them to accept me may i ask a question yes um well it's more a statement i want to say to you that your photographs are elegant they <laughs> capture so much more than just a movement and you are not a street photographer you are truly an artist as you bring us into the faces of the people in such an intimate way and i love <coughs> your portraits and even when you cut out the part of the flag or whatever you cut out before i just think that was extraordinary i love your work i appreciate that and thank you and that's what looking at my work now because i i've never thought like this that's what i want when people see the work i want them to feel the work i want you to look at i think in journalism is like they look at them as victims i don't look at that i look human i want to show the humanity yes and, and thank you, you for that and you do thank you and, and if i could add to um i'm not sure if you can hear me Yes, I can hear you. Okay, what the gentleman just said, uh, your work is so powerful, um, and you've accomplished what you set out to do. Because I am sitting here right now feeling so many different emotions mm -hmm. after looking at your work. So what you set out to do, you truly have accomplished. And for that, I thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> mm. One thing I want to talk about, I want to ask about is um, just the... You know, when you were asked to cover um, racism by the Washington Post and um, choosing and just the courage of looking at Stone Mountain, because um, from what I know about Stone Mountain and I've been there and I know it's it's absolutely terrifying history. Um, I yeah. even think it takes enormous courage to even look for the beauty in that space because it's been it's 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 been such a place of pain and um and so i just i felt i felt um i felt kind of protective but also just admiring the courage it took to make those work those photographs 
You know, it was hard because um, my mother and father is no longer um, with us. And it made me think a lot about them because they were brought up, you know, in Jim Crow law. And I felt that I needed to do this because one thing that my mother told me about my father, the reason why he um, was in the service was because he spoke up when he saw wrong. And if they wouldn't have got him out of that town, that he would have been lynched. So I think my father is the one that taught me about fear and not to have fear. And my mother was the one that kept the glue of us together as a family. So going to that stone mountain, and to see that carving or the Confederate flag is a lot of emotions do come up. Mm -hmm. A lot it is, but I have to, as a person, as an artist, as a woman, I have to look at this in order to progress, okay? Because that's where the imagination comes from I'm gonna imagine what does liberation look like? And I think for all of us now, with what happened with George Floyd, all of us are feeling a certain way, him and COVID-19 and about our freedom and our rights. Mm -hmm. I'd like to open it up some more if people would like to talk to and ask questions of Sheila. How do you feel about what just has happened with the removal of, or the beginning of the removal of statues in Virginia? I know they carted away um, Robert E. Lee recently, and they're talking about others. Are you tempted to go there and photograph? I don't know yet. Um, see, with me now, because I've been photographing like protests, I'm trying to see how me as an artist can um, not necessarily go there and photograph it. It's just like how I did with Stone Mountain. How can I talk about this in a different way to elevate people, okay? I wish in Atlanta, and I don't know, that they will deal with that carving at Stone Mountain Park. And I think that's gonna be very difficult because in Atlanta, they ha everybody's kind of passive aggressive here from whites and blacks. So it's gonna be interesting if I could say it like that. See, I'm not from Atlanta. And my one thing that my father told me is to always speak the truth, always speak the truth. So I think this is a beginning for us, but we cannot stay, we cannot go on cruise control. We're gonna have, we don't have to do nothing, <laughs> but it would be nice for us to progress. So I don't know if, um, I don't know when they're gonna do that. I might go up there, I don't know. There's, um, oh, sorry. No, um, go ahead, sorry. So, um, Kate asked another question. Um, she, she writes, I wish, uh, I was thinking, it looks like you shoot with a two and a quarter, which you, which since you say Abaddon inspired, you makes a lot of sense, but what do you shoot with? Okay. The, well, I'm gonna start from hip hop. That was 35 millimeter film, okay? Suburbia was um, Mamiya 6.7 film camera, okay? Mm -hmm. From there, believe it or not, 1960 now was shot all on the Olympus camera, Michael Four Thirds camera. People cannot believe that. Okay. Now the I don't reason know the, I don't know the camera is that film. No, the Olympus is digital. It's digital and it's Michael Four Thirds. Okay, but the recent work that I've been shooting with, like the recent images that I shot of the mothers, not the well, the portraits of the mother were shot with the Hasselblad X One D. 40 megapixel. And then I'm shooting, I'm an ambassador for Leica, and I'm shooting with the Leica SL and the M10 and the Q. <laughs> so I'm all over the place with cameras, y'all. But let me tell you this, since I'm shooting with Leica, I could tell a difference. I could tell a big difference, okay? 
and I love it. I'm trying to sell my Hasselblad X1D. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a question about plastic bodies. Do you have any images from plastic bodies? And I can say that sh we do not, but I can call up a website if you want to talk a little bit about that body of work. It's up to you. Oh, okay. Is okay. it all right? You're gonna pull up, yeah, you're going to pull up the website? I already did. Okay. Yeah. Um, plastic bodies, remember what I told you in the beginning, how I like to look at historical context, and that really... Um, makes helps me think about work and what I want to do. Um, plastic bodies came out of a friend of mine. I was in grad school. She came to me, she's white, and she said, Sheila, Sheila, I saw BET for the first time and I thought it was soft porn. I'm like, what? <laughs> she said, I thought it was soft porn. So it got me thinking about the black female body and I started doing research about the black female body and it led me to the hot and top Venus. I started photo, uh, I don't know if anybody, the hot and top, I don't know if anybody knows about how black women got their negative stereotypes from because they have more up, more buttocks, more breasts, more up. And so they were thought that that's why they were hypersexual, that kind of thing. So I started photographing women, I could tell you this, sometimes when I start photographing, that is not my body of work, okay? And when I started um, photographing the Barbie dolls, I was looking about, I was looking at black women bodies and I wanted to know how they felt about their bodies. And so I would take portraits of women from 18, I don't have any of that up on website or not, 18 because it wasn't my body work, 18 on 80, and I would have them come into the studio and ask them this one thing, how do you feel about your sexuality? And, and, and whatever you want to do, I'll take the photograph. So one thing led to another. I started looking at the iconic image of the Barbie doll, how all women, and I didn't play with the Barbie doll when I was young, um, could not fit that standard idea, beauty standard, and especially women of color, because we have more of. And so I'm playing a fine line between reality and non-reality non and the effects that this have on especially women of color because they cannot fit that beauty standard you have the woman in the you have the barbie doll in, in in the dreads and at that time you have not never seen a barbie doll with dreads and you have little girls coming up and that all they see and that's what they want to look like or what they want to do so and i call this plastic bodies and her one arm is impossible the right left arm like that right. that, right. that right. doesn't exist that arm can't exist so i digitally composite those images i would photograph a woman i would photograph the barbie doll and i, I would it is digital compositing but if i could say it like this it's, um, I don't know if anybody know about the artist Hannah Hock. Um, she was from the Dada movement. She would um, do collaging Oway, and that's all I'm doing with the Barbie doll, but it's digital and through in Photoshop. I, I, I say that we, I say that we have become plastic, and the Barbie doll has become human. Yeah, and it's a it's a political movement, like just like that Hannah's work was. Yeah, that, yeah, kind of hot. Yeah, right. It's just a different way. It's not documentary in style, but it's, um, it's art. Right, right. You know, challenging yeah. what the mainstream culture is telling us. Oh, someone put it, the link up on. You can see her. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, I couldn't get your slideshow going on that, but um, everybody okay. go to the website. Um, the next uh, um, comment is from Lex. Uh, I really love your work. Thank you so much for sharing your art with the world. What really struck me while looking at your pictures is that you can see love between you and your subject, contrasting the harshness of imagery in the mass media and something not a lot of photographers can achieve. Thank you again. 
Well, thank you because I had the Washington Post call me. Sheila, have you been photographed in protests? I said, yes, I have, black and white, but from my own perspective. And I sent him the images that I shot of the press conference. He said, oh my God. So I think as image makers, you got to take a stand because how are we going to change the narrative? Okay. Because I think in society, we tend to gravitate to the neg negativity. And when you see things like my suburbia work, like what in the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I think because you're going to, you're going to have negative and positive, but we don't have enough positive to balance that out, to see that. Yes. Um, from Manny, what photo shoots would you like to cross off your bucket list? What photo shoots? I don't know. <laughs> cross out? I, I, I'm challenged with everything. That's one thing as an image maker. It's like right now in COVID-19. I never knew that I would be photographing flowers, okay? And I'm really having fun with it. And I'm going to show that I'm shooting it with different kind of gels and stuff, not like invasive. So, and I think that will help you as an image maker to move forward with work based on what we're dealing with now. You never know what's going to come out of it. So I don't cross nothing out. <laughs> That's great. Um, <laughs> From George. Oh, is there somebody who wants to say, ask something? Oh, no. Uh, George Slade asks, I remember there being more work on your Instagram feed. Have you moved, removed a lot? Say that again now, because I was. It's okay. I remember there being more work on your Instagram feed. Have you removed a lot? The first of the year, I kind of wiped it all out. And I started all over again because a lot of people were thinking that I'm just a street documentary photographer and I didn't want to show that and so and then I don't post a lot just the post okay <laughs> so I have moved a lot out you know I think sometimes as an image maker for me you have to be kind of mysterious you know because people like when I put some of my story they're waiting to see what I'm you know I'm gonna do <laughs> you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. I have a comment from uh, Betsy Hansel. You have given me the courage to dig in my heels and take a stand even facing heavy criticism. Thank you. Right. Because mm -hmm. you, you, I tell every artist this. If it's like the art world, everybody's not going to be in galleries. Everybody is not. You know what I'm saying? They, they're not totally. going to do that. But if, you, if you're going to go, don't go in a corner and sit and cry. Just um, do the work. And that's what I do. I'm not represented by a gallery. A lot of people are wondering, how do you get yourself in the museum? How are you doing that? I keep working. I keep creating. And I keep doing. And it's just like, um, Lori, I never knew she'd been looking at my work for years. The mom would just call me. We need to see some of your work, okay? You have to, it's hard. I mean, you have to have a tough skin. You have to have a tough skin in anything, but it's a tough skin. I mean, and you can't let labels dictate who you are. Because some artists is like, and I'm not putting off on artists, I'm talking about me. When I first got my first show and I had a, um, and I was in, the show was a group show. I'm going back to the hip hop. It was a group show and it was three other women photographers that had received their MFAs. And they had a panel discussion. Oh, naive again. All oh, this is new to me, right? So I get up there and I'm listening. And I'm like, why do they say they don't want to be in my head? They want to be called a black <laughs> photographer, okay? I got up and said, I am black. And if I want to photograph a white person, a tree, or whatever, I am. I think for far too long as African Americans, it's like, oh, that's a dirty word. You can't do that. And you can't worry about labels because people are going to label you. Because you would, you would, they will label you and you could use that as a stumbling block and you can't move forward. You're just going to have to move forward. That's how I think, okay? Sheila, um, 
Um, another person in the chat said, your creativity brings your narrative into the realm of American history, which will stand longer in the test of time compared to phonodrillism. So you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Um, thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, one one uh, attendee said, asked if you use captions. I only, you know, I have a book out and they, I have to use captions, <laughs> you know, I didn't want to. And then my artwork, a lot of times, like when I first started out, like Plastic Bodies, I didn't have like a name for each one. I just call it Plastic Bodies on Title I, on Title II, you know, that kind of thing. And the same way with Suburbia, because that's just a whole body of work but with the with the with 1960 now you have to put captions on that to let people know what it was yeah so we're coming close to eight o'clock Sheila is there anything else you want to say or is there anything from um everyone joined with with us tonight who want to ask Sheila something All I can say is I don't know how many image makers are there. I just want to part onto you is that we're in hard times, but don't let that bring you down. Create, 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 and you'll never know what will come out of anything. I never knew. I just I follow the pulse of what's in my heart in popular culture never knew that 1969 was going to be a series or a book at all i just do the work it's like it's like i have a lot of young people come to me it's like well how did you get into the museum how do you do that da, da, da? i said i do the work just keep doing the work and create i hear you on that mm -hmm. so i want to thank everyone for being here um it's lovely to see you I ask that you stay safe, and I ask you to stay strong. Yeah, and the same to you, everybody, and um, be safe and healthy and much love, and thank you. Thank, thank you, Sheila. All right, take Bye. care. Okay. <laughs> Bye, much love. <laughs> okay. Bye.